it is uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Asher, Professor Asher Kurati. He is Director Professor of ENT. He is working in New Delhi at the Department of ENT, Head and Neck Surgery at the Mona Azad Medical College. He is uh, uh, the partner of uh, a joint program we have uh, between Italy and India at the working on uh, obstetrics diphonia and obesity. We know that both uh, uh, aspects are very important in the, not only in clinical terms, but in, also in terms of uh, public health. So I'm really pleased to have his uh, introduction to the topic, his views, all is important and relevant, also in the perspective of public health and future quality actions. This is you. Thank you, Dario. You know, coming to Padova is a pleasure, and being with all of you is a privilege to me. Professor Dario mentioned the issue of obesity. Obesity is an issue which today concerns every one of us, more so in the children. The reason being because today children are the ones who are going to make the country tomorrow. And any issue that involves the children today affects the health of the nation tomorrow. Apart from obesity, it carries on with it so many other issues like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, orthopedic related problems. So this is one area where prevention would always be better than the cure, which is why the Indo-Italian partnership came across for this project on obesity and its effects in children. As an outcome of that, to study the obstructive sleep apnea was what we had envisaged in the project. And we are taking the study forward by the day, by the month. Another issue which is important is the emergencies which come in the pediatric age group as far as EAT is concerned. If we see the statistics of the otolaryngological emergencies which come, uh, they form a big chunk of the emergency services in a hospital and that is also what prompted us to go into this. In fact, another project which Professor Dario is doing on the Susi Safe project is the one which we, we are collaborating on to collate all the physical data of the foreign bodies which come across. Because ours being a tertiary care hospital with an average daily EAT attendance of about 500 patients per day and a total annual uh, OPD turnout of 2.6 million patients per annum for the hospital, we are dealing with a great many things which come across as emergencies. So we have a fairly interesting group of foreign bodies which come across, which we shall be presenting. So the two talks which I am going to just delve upon, one is on obstructive sleep apnea as a problem, and the other is the emergencies in the pediatric age group as far as otolaryngology is concerned. So coming down to the pediatric emergencies in otolaryngology. I want you to see this picture. Now this picture shows a very interesting concoction. It shows an image which is there. If you see the image carefully, you see an old lady with, who is there and you see it in a different perspective. And if you see it in a different perspective, you see the old lady being transformed into a young girl. So what is visible actually is how you want to look at it in a perceptual viewpoint. I quote Arnold Glasgow who stated that one of the true tests of leadership is the ability to recognize a problem before it becomes an emergency. So while I was talking to the director of the institute today morning, he said something about do this quick, do this quick, do this quick. And why it is to be done quick is so that that situation does not turn into an emergency. And as we all know, handling an emergency is more difficult than handling a cold case. So we talk about an overview. What I'm going to talk about are the pathological problems, the nasal problems, facial, oral and pharyngeal problems and air obstruction. So these are the issues which we are going to delve upon. Pediatric emergencies in otolaryngology in a metropolitan city. I quote a study which was done by us 
that one third of the problem which come in an ENT setup come to the pediatric age. So that is what made us analyze this situation. And this data which comes across would help us to analyze what would be the future. Now I want you to look at this house. This house shows three areas. And these three areas, if I look at it, depict the human ear. We have on the extreme right, the house which is the main building. Now what would that house? It would house a drawing room, the dining room, the areas where one would live the maximum. And if you look at that, that is the area which one wants to keep the most beautiful area in the house because that's where your guests come, your friends come. Then we come down to the second part, the middle part. That is the effective part of a house where we have our bedroom, we have our bathrooms, we can have our kitchen. That's where the effective living occurs. That is my area and your area. So I want that to be a comfortable area. And then I see the third part inside. The third part inside is the inner side. It can also be termed as an attic, it can be termed as an inner store. That is an area where nobody goes, but it's an essential feature of every house because that's where we store all our essential things. But we are scared to enter it because there's so many skeletons hidden over there that I don't want to go over there. So if you look at the ear, it also is of three different zones. So this is the outer ear, which is the pinna, if I look at it, and that is the most beautiful part of the ear because that is present outside. So that is the drawing room and the dining room of my house. I can adorn it, I can adorn it with solitaire, with earring, with studs, whatever I want. So I can make it the most beautiful part. This is the inner part which is the functional part of the house. Like I said, the bedroom, the kitchen and everything where we stay, it has to be most comfortable and the most important part, that is my mid layer. Mid layer has my three ossicles, the malleus, the incus and the stapes and that forms the basic conduction mechanism for the sound transmission into the inner ear. The inner ear is the one which is important but which is not visible to the eye and that is the inner store room. And from here, from the back door, my cochlear nerve goes out and it carries my sensations to the brain for the hearing to be analyzed. So I can correlate the ear to the comforts of a house. So when we talk about emergencies, one of the most common emergencies which comes across in a child is earache. I mean every child would have had an earache at some time or the other. So what happens is that most common cause if you look at it is, is wax in the ear. Wax is not what is conventionally what you term it as wax. If, if, if that's wax is what you would conventionally term it, I would probably take a million population, get the wax out, probably hold it into a candle and have a distance of candles over there, but it doesn't work out that way. Wax is nothing but collection of the dead epithelium, the debris, the hair, the dust, everything which collects in the ear and the ear secretes out uh, something, an oily substance, the sebum and the, all that muck which is there gets entrapped in this oily substance and forms a semi pultaceous mass which is known as a wax. Now wax is a hydrated thing but over a period of time the water from it evaporates and that wax becomes hard. So it can impact my external auditory canal, the canal which goes from the outside to the middle part of the ear till my eardrum and that can cause severe pain, it can cause a hearing loss. So the most common cause for uh, pain in the ear or for a hearing loss be wax impacted. Now if you see wax has different concoctions. This is a traditional, if you come down to India sometimes you will see roadside ENT people sitting over there, I won't call them ENT but wax sitting over there trying to clean the ear. The ear is there, they have a stick, they have the sunlight and with that they are trying to clean the ear. And this is what it is. A very dangerous situation, it can cause perforation in the eardrum, it can cause fungus in the ear, ear, all sorts of problems can occur because it's an untrained person and it is an unhygienic situation. The other wax is what is world known as Madhav Prasad's Museum, has beautiful wax structures, you want any, any individual to come across and, and that individual is a beauty. But this is what wax in its true form is. What causes the problems? Today, earbuds are something which are used left, right and centre by everybody. But have you realized what the implications of using a earbud are? They're dangerous at times. Like I told you, wax is a semi-soft, pultaceous material. So when I take the earbud, I try to clean the ear. The thickness of the earbud is approximately the same as that of my external auditory canal. So what I'm in effect doing is, I'm putting the earbud tip inside. The wax is pushed inside. And now imagine that the soft, pultaceous material, my external auditory canal is like a cylinder, 
locked on the eardrum on one side and open on the other side. So once the wax goes and compresses with the eardrum, it compresses further, causes hearing loss total, causes pain and causes uh, uh, total blockage of the ear. So using of the earbuds is something which is no no and should be followed. As a public health thing, clean the ear but not with the wax. That's what ENT surgeons are meant for. Come down for a cleaning. Just like car gets serviced, why don't we get an ear serviced once a year or six months? So we need to soften the wax to remove it. We have wax solvents. How to put the wax is again important. How to put the wax solvents is again important. What we do is we can just tilt the head up, put three to four drops, and you see this cover, this is known the tragus, press it four to five times so that the medicine goes inside and softens the wax. This needs to be done for three to four days. Wax becomes softens out. You can easily remove it, you can easily set it out. So that's how it would normally work. Another issue which comes is otitis externa. Now, if you see this house, it is exposed outside to the vagaries of monsoons, to the sun, to everything, and you see the paint peeling off. This is what happens to the ear also. We have repeated exposure to moisture, we have repeated exposure to trauma, we have repeated exposure to certain medicines, drugs, cosmetics, so many things which comes across, hair dyes, and that can cause an irritation of the outer ear. Outer is external, otitis is ear, otitis externa, inflammation of the external ear. And that is what another emergency which can come across, you can have severe pain. It can be acute, it can be subacute, it can be chronic. Now let's see how the thing works. If you see the area over here, this is the outer ear and this is the external aortic canal and over here we have the ear canal. So this part is the external ear. Now the external canal is divided into two parts, the inner part and the outer part. The outer part is a cartilaginous part and the inner part is a outer part. It is the cartilaginous part which has hair follicles and which has oil secreting glands. And those glands when they get blocked lead to the formation of a furuncle, they can cause infection, they can lead to furuncle. So a furuncle which is present will be present only in the outer part of the external canal and not on the inner canal. So one has to be careful for the diagnosis over there. And why is it painful? Because the outer part is cartilage, cartilage is covered by a layer known as perichondrium. When the perichondrium gets inflamed, that causes severe pain. Perichondritis, and that is what is the acute emergency over here. It is normally a staphylococcal infection and that needs to be treated with. Then comes the furuncle, how does it look like? Now this is how a furuncle would look like. You see in the outer part, you see uh, the hair over there and this hair follicle has got infected and this is what is a furunculosis. It is localized otitis externa. Inflammation in the outer ear but localized, not a diffuse one. It can cause pain, it can cause pruritus or itching, it can cause a hearing loss. If you examine it, you will have edema over there, you will have congestion over there, you will have tenderness that is pain or pressing and you will have a cohesion of fluctuance with the this called abscess which has formed. So this needs to be treated by antibiotics. Then comes our next problem. We have beauty in its true sense. I will show you two pictures. This lady is by the name of Madhubala. And she is supposed to be the most beautiful Indian actress who has ever come. She is eternal beauty, Madhubala. And you see the other beauty below that, the Mona Lisa. So both of them have a mysterious smile. And that is the essence of beauty. But beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. You see the other pictures around. They are also beautiful. And again I go back to the quotation that if beauty could kill, so can firmness. Because both are beautiful. You see the two ladies on the left who are beautiful and you see the other pictures which are fungus which are also beautiful. But they are painful. It's not that the beautiful woman cannot be a pain or a beautiful smart man cannot be a pain, they can be, but fungus is a painful situation. What is fungus? Orthomycosis. Mycosis is fungus, my spicy name is fungus, osis is inflammation, invasion of the ear, otitis with fungus, orthomycosis. So, automycosis is infection, fungal infection of the ear. It can cause uh, external ear infection, it can cause pain, it can cause congestion, it can cause ear discharge, it can cause hearing loss. And the most common organism fungus which are involved either are Aspergillus or Candidiasis. Aspergillus niger, Candida albicans are the two fungi which are most common. The treatment over here is removal of the fungus, which is very important, sucking out of the fungus and putting an antifungal drops. 
avoid water going in the ear. This is something which again needs to be taught how to avoid water going in the ear. As again, I'll come back to a public education system, how do one go about it? You can take a big wad of cotton, smear it with Vaseline and plug your external ear. It should not be put as a dry cotton because that will absorb water and more water will go inside. So rather than prevent water from going inside, you're going to make a bigger mess of it. So if you coat it with Vaseline, it becomes a waterproof thing. And after every bath, one needs to clean the ear, dry it up without a bud. You can just take a cotton wick and clean your ear gently with that. You can use spirit, you can use ethyl alcohol to clean the ear so that it can be dried and prevent the fungus. Fungus will be present whenever there is moisture left in the external canal because then it is moist. It is 37 degrees, it is dark and it forms, it has nutrition and it forms a very good nidus for the fungus to grow. You can imagine you have a piece of bread which is moist and kept overnight. In the morning you see the green fungus on it. So just imagine if the same situation occurs in the ear, what is going to happen? So that is what happens and this is automycosis. We need to clean it and we need to add it. Then perichondritis. I have mentioned before perichondritis. Perichondrin is the covering which covers the cartilage and inflammation of that causes a problem. When it causes a problem, it causes inflammation. The perichondrin is very sensitive. Cartilage is not sensitive to pain. The perichondrin which is sensitive to pain and that causes the pain which the child complains. So we need to treat the, that with anti-inflammatory and antibiotics. Then we have the perforation in the eardrum. If we see the perforation in the eardrum, this is an eardrum which you are seeing over here and a perforation is here. How can the perforation be caused? It can be caused by using direct trauma. You have one of the most common, you sit in a train, you sit in a bus and you see, observe people. One of the national pastimes, the national hobbies is taking a matchstick and trying to clean the air. It gives a sadistic pleasure inside. But you have to realize the external aortic canal is 2.56 centimeters down the line. And if you are going to go deeper than that, the next structure that comes over there is the eardrum. And you will perforate the eardrum, you have nothing but a flaccid, small membrane sort of a thing. You put in a matchstick, you go through and through, and that is what a perforation will cause. How else can it be caused? Physical trauma. I can hang with somebody a snap on the ear. The external aortic canal we said is a cylinder. When I give a slap over here, the external aortic canal, the air inside gets compressed, and the eardrum has an implosive force inside, and you have a perforation. What else can cause it? Sound trauma. I put a bomb blast, I put a cracker, suddenly in the ear. A sudden change in the pressure occurs that can cause perforation in the eardrum. Infection, that can cause perforated eardrum, but that again is an emergency. So <clears throat> you need to identify how uh, uh, eardrum perforation looks like and manage it accordingly. That is again an emergency which comes across. After that we come to the middle part, the mid ear. Now if we see what happens, we have a child who is being fed breastfed or bottle fed. Now it seems a very simple job but it's not that simple a job. Breastfeeding as we all know protects the baby, it gives immunity to the baby. But a situation comes when feeding in the wrong manner can be a cause for ear infection, can be a cause for a problem. How does it happen? A new mother would probably be lying down and feeding the child. The baby is lying down, the baby is fed or the baby is being breastfed at night, the mother is sleepy, the baby wakes up mother puts the child to the breast, tries to feed and the baby is lying down. There's a tube which connects the back part of the nose into the in mid ear. Now that tube is known as the eustachian tube. Infection can travel through this eustachian tube into the ear. Same way the milk which is there when the child is lying down because in a child the eustachian tube is much wider and much straighter than an adult so it tends to flow through it. So if I'm feeding the child while the child is lying down, the milk can flow through it and enter the mid ear leading to infection. So that can cause inflammation, that can cause secretitis media, it can cause acute otitis media, acute pain in the ear and that is why a baby cries. When you have a crying baby, there are only few causes which a baby is crying for. Either the baby is hungry or the baby has stomach pain or the baby has ear pain. If you rule out all three, most of the times the baby will be alright. So we need to look into all this. Now diving is something which all of us do. Everybody you see, you can see the chaps diving and everybody can dive. So there is no issue with that. The same way, just like everybody can dive, everybody can fly also. There is no problem in flying. But then, even if you can fly, even if you can dive, what happens? Some have an ear pain, some don't have an ear pain. Why? 
This is something which is important and this barrel drop. Pressure changes with jagger. If I'm diving, all of us have gone in for scuba diving or for simple diving, etc. When we're going down the water, we feel a pressure in the ear. Similarly, when we are flying up and we are landing down, we have a sudden ear pain. People tend to use ear plugs, put cotton, it doesn't work at all. That's not the physiology behind it. The physiology behind it is the tube at the back part of the nose to the ear, the eustachian tube, because of the pressure changes, that collapses. Once that collapses, our mid ear becomes a closed cavity. The function of the tube is on one side is the atmospheric pressure, on the other side is the mid ear. So the mid ear pressure is the same as that of the atmospheric pressure. But once this tube closes, the ear becomes a closed cavity and the air inside is absorbed. Once it is absorbed, you get sucked in and that is what causes the pain. That is what causes the barotrauma. That is what causes a sudden effusion of fluid inside because of the negative pressure. When the fluid is effused, it is secretly otitis media that gets infected. It is acute otitis media. So that is why people with, who are flying when they have a nasal cold or when they are diving when they have a nasal cold tend to get this pain more often, tend to get the ear infection more often. It is not only governed with that, there are many other immunological issues which come across and that is what governs the etiopathogenesis of acute otitis media. So if we see the etiopathogenesis of this, we have a tubal occlusion, the occlusion of the eustachian tube. This leads to a reduced mid ear ventilation pressure. The absorption of the air from the mid ear occurs. There is a negative pressure in the mid ear and a tympanic membrane retracts. Like I showed you, there is a negative pressure and the ear drum goes inside. So here the eardrum is going inside. Now what happens when it goes inside? Once it goes inside, the negative pressure sucks in certain bacteria from the nose and the nasopharynx into the mid ear. Those pyogenic organisms cause an infection inside and this leads to this congestion of the eardrum. You can see the congested eardrum. Now once this congestion occurs, then the pus develops inside. So now you see when the pus develops inside, the eardrum starts bulging out. So over here you see the eardrum which is bulging out now. And this eardrum, if it is not controlled, will rupture leading to perforation. But once it ruptures, the pain eases. So we have a negative pressure which will cause a hearing loss, which will cause some amount of pain. Once we have a bulge, it will cause a hearing loss, but it will cause severe pain. Once it ruptures, the pain will settle down, hearing loss will persist till the eardrum heals. So that is how the natural history of the otitis media occurs. So if we see the various stages, we see the first stage, we have mild congestion. We see the second stage, which is a bulging. The next stage, a perforation has occurred, which is healing. And finally, it is the heal stage. It is the natural history of otitis media. How did the patient present? Fever, pain, cold runny nose, ear discharge, congested, tympanic membrane, or perforation. So that's how it would be present. You would have to treat it with antibiotics or treated surgically by putting in what is known as a grome. A grome is nothing but a sort of a bobbin which is put in the eardrum and it forms a natural drainage for the pus to occur. This is done through a small opening in the eardrum myringotomy. Myringum is the word for eardrum, otomy is an opening, opening the eardrum is myringotomy. So once we have this, if the child is repeatedly having this problem, we put in a grome for a longer period, the problem tends to settle down. Ear pain can also be a referred pain. I need not have a problem in the ear. I can have an infected tonsil, I can have a tonsillolith, I can have an elongated stylet process. All these issues can cause a referred pain. How is the referred pain caused? We have the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the same nerve which supplies. So any problems in the surrounding area, the tooth, if you must have had a toothache sometimes, if a toothache is referred to, it can have pain in the ear. I have a bad tonsils, I can have pain in the ear. That is because the nerve supply to the ear, to the tonsil, nerve ear and to my uh, tooth is, a, is the same and therefore the pain gets transmitted along the same areas. Seventh nerve paralysis. Seventh nerve is the facial nerve. Facial nerve is the fallopius nerve. Now I am in Padova today. Fallopius was uh, alumni of this institute. He has taught over here long time back and this gentleman described what is known as the fallopian canal. The fallopian canal contains the facial nerve and that facial nerve is the most important structure as far as the ear surgeon is concerned. So for my speciality, somewhere down the line, I am indebted to the University of Padova for making me learn and realize the importance of the facial nerve. 
in most of the cases, a facial nerve paralysis would occur as an idiopathic. Idiopathic meaning no, no reason for it. And that could be a viral, could be any other known cause, unknown cause, and that is termed as a Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is after a gentleman known as Bell. It's a facial nerve paralysis, sudden paralysis, no reason, could be viral. There are other reasons for facial paralysis. Infection can occur, chronic subarthritis media can occur, trauma can occur, uh, certain immunological disorders can occur. All of, them, all of them can cause facial paralysis. But uh, Bell's palsy would be one of the most common causes. It's normally a self-healing process. It takes about three, four, four weeks to settle down, but it comes back. Treatment would remain antivirals and symptomatic treatment for that. Then we come down to the next part, which is the foreign bodies. Foreign bodies are something which is the most important emergencies which occur. If we see in the age group of three to four years, they are very common, and in the elderly age group, they are very common. Three to four years, because child is a natural explorer. He likes to explore every cavity in his body. And the most accessible cavity for him is the ear, the nose, and the mouth. So he tends to, whatever he has, he tends to put it reflexively inside while exploring it, see what the effects are, and as an accident, it can go in. The other age group is the senior age group, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. Why? Because they don't have teeth. They don't have that sensation. They cannot chew properly. So at times, they may swallow without realizing, including the denture itself. So denture itself can be a foreign body. That itself can be an uh, emergency. So in a child, a foreign body is one of the most important thing, which is what, we, like I said before, forms the basis of our, uh, doing this project. So nose would be 45%, ear would be 25 esophagus 21%, so if you see the distribution of foreign bodies, it's a fairly well distributed area which is there. Two to four years, I said, is most common. Acute episode of choking. Now normally, you may not get a history of a foreign body. A child is lying down, he is probably has some peanuts lying over there or something lying around and the mother complains the child was lying down. Suddenly he choked and then he was okay. You have to keep in mind, you may not have much of history, but a child who has choked suddenly, a child who has choked over nothing, you have to go out a foreign body unless and until proved otherwise, golden victim of life. They may not manifest with any signs, so you have to have a strong clinical judgment, a strong clinical sense to find out what would happen, what could have happened. Foreign bodies in the ears could be anything, ranging from bits of papers to batteries to maggots to pearls to vegetable foreign bodies. Anything can happen and, and can go into the ear. Treatment remains number one, remove it using a hook or a syringe, but when it's a vegetable foreign body, let's say a kidney bean or a wheat grain, do not use syringing because if you use syringing and it doesn't come out, that soaks in the moisture, moisture tends to expand that foreign body and to cause further expansion, further blockage and further pain, so you need to be careful. Kill, not the patient, the living foreign body inside. You have an insect inside, so you've got to remove it, put some chloroform inside, the insect will die, gently remove it and suck it out. But while removing it, be very careful of not causing an injury. So do not be the effect of the foreign body by causing a further injury. Maggots. Now you see uh, insects and maggots in the ear. If I don't maintain a good hygiene or if I'm having a discharging ear, I don't clean my ear regularly, flies would tend to sit and flies would lay their eggs over there and they in turn develop maggots. And maggots survive inside the dark area, moist area, good nutrition, so they have a field day inside and they keep on feeding on the soft tissue around and that is also an emergency. So you need to clean the ear, you need to clean the maggots, you need to clean everything over there. This is a child who came across. Now this child, if you see, has got a severe cellulitis over there and this is the part which is behind the ear. It is infested with maggots. There was a small injury, the parents did not take care for it and he developed maggots. We had to treat the maggots, he developed an orbital cellulitis, he developed an intracranial problem, the child survived, but it was a touch and go. So you have to be careful that you have to maintain a good hygiene. And these maggots may develop not only in the ear, they can develop in the nose, they can develop in the sinuses, they can develop anywhere, wherever you have open festering food. Another interesting thing, see this foreign body over here? This is the battery. The child put a battery in the ear, and after putting the battery in the ear, the mother tried to remove it with the matchstick, went through the eardrum, it perforated the eardrum into the middle ear and we had to open up to get this foreign body out. See this foreign body. Can you identify it? It's a nut. It's a nut in the nose. Same thing over here. The child just put the nut in the nose, we removed it. Not a very complicated thing. 
There's a vegetable foreign body over here sitting in the nasopharynx. The child put it in the nose, it slipped into the nasopharynx. The problem with these foreign bodies is, if you try to remove it and you're not trained enough, they can slip inside and go into either the bronchus or the esophagus. Foreign body in the aeronatus plaque. They are the bane of any cardiothoracic surgeon, EAT surgeon, chest physician, everybody. They are scared of these because they cause a problem. But severity is determined on what is the size of the foreign body, what is the foreign body, where is it located, how long has it been located, because it could be an old foreign body also, and what are the causes. It would go in the right bronchus more, because the right bronchus is larger in diameter if it goes into the air tract. The right bronchus is larger, the air flow is more than in the left, the, there's a narrow angle while it bifurcates, so the foreign body is tend to go to the right side much more. Once it goes inside, it can cause a collapse of the lung on that side, because there is no airway. Plain radiography, 25% can be identified, maybe more than 50% of the lesions cannot show up, may not show up also. You may have to do a fluoroscopy, but the gold standard is, if you suspect it, have a look inside, do a laryngoscopy, do a bronchoscopy, do a esophagoscopy. Now, the nut, the nut, areca nut, a safety pin. It's an open safety pin. This is simple to remove, not a problem. But if the safety pin is reversed, then it is a problem. You drag it out, you're going to tear the esophagus. A coin, a coin. A nut swallowed inside. A screw. There's a fish bone over here. A screw in the bronchus. A nail inside. Then you see this, this is a meat bolus inside. Now, we have a festival which is known as a feasting period. In the Ramazan, we have a fasting period. And the fast is broken in the, in the Muslims. They have the Ramazan month and the fast is broken at night. So at times, one tends to eat much faster. And in that eating faster, if you are an elderly individual or a child, you tend to swallow a meat bolus along with that. And that can cause a structure. Over here, if you see, the air shadow is compromised and there's a bulge over here. It's a small child who took who chewed more than he could bite and he got choked on it. This is a very interesting foreign body, an earring. I'll show you this in my next slide. A spring inside, a spring inside. This is a spring we remove. A glass piece inside. So you just keep on imagining what all foreign bodies can come. A battery. Now, this was when we removed the battery. This is how it looked like. It was inside for the last 15 days. So the chemicals had come out and had coated the battery black. So this is what the battery would look like. This is how the battery is. You see, this is a double coil appearance. If you see a battery, it has got a two, um, uh, two like two discs are on top of the other. So this could have a diagnostic for a battery. This is another battery. It had eroded the esophagus and it went into the mediastinum. We had to go through a cartoon to remove this battery inside. So batteries are again a very dangerous thing to have. Another very interesting thing. You, you cannot even imagine what this foreign body is, it's a piece of a mechanical toy, the legal, you know, the, the mechanics which come in for children to make, and this is what it was. The child had swallowed it. A magnet piece. Now, when we ask for toys to be made, we want them to be made according to particular standards, so that they don't break, the pieces don't break off. And this is a piece of magnet he broke off from a child, from the toy, and the child had to swallow it because he was holding the toy in his mouth. Another foreign body, you see this hook over there, this is the hook which is there, we had to remove this, this is a dangerous thing because it can tear the esophagus over here when we are removing it. This is again a very interesting foreign body, you, you, you know the cars which are there, you have a wheel and a spoke in the middle, the child swallowed the wheel and the spoke and this is what the wheel is there and this is what the spoke is there. So this is a foreign body which was removed. A screw, a, a pin tack over there, this is what was there. Areca nut. Nuts are again foreign bodies which can be swallowed. This child almost lost him. We had to do a trichostomy to save him. And then a nut was removed. This is nut which was removed. You can see it's almost a two inch big nut. Another nut you can see over here. This is the trachea, the two bronchi. And this is where the obstruction is there. This is where we brought out this nut. This is a seven year old child. A whistle. This child again presented outside. He was treated as bronchial asthma because they never used to blow out and he was breathe out the air used to go through the whistle and it produced a whistling sound. So the doctors thought it was a bronchial asthma, it was a wheeze, but it was not a wheeze. It was a foreign body which had gone in, it was lying there for the last one and a half months, and the whistle from behind the toy had been swallowed inside. You see the nozzle of a syringe, 
Rukov, he was chewing on the syringe. A meat bone. This is where the meat bone is stuck. This is where the meat bone is stuck. This is the size of the meat bone. So almost if you see a 4 cm, 3 cm meat bone inside. Another meat bone. It's a fresh bone which was removed. Another peculiar thing, a tracheostomy tube. Tracheostomy tube, we put the tracheostomy over here for helping the breathing. The patient had been reusing the tracheostomy tube for boiling it, so the joint broke off and the tube went inside. So this is again a foreign body, which is not a very common foreign body. So you see a wide variety of foreign bodies, and this is what we are doing every day, day in and day out, and these foreign bodies are the ones which create a problem. The next evidence which comes epistaxis. Epistaxis is what? Bleeding from the nose. When I talk about bleeding from the nose, bleeding from the nose occurs most commonly in nose picking. Now, again, if you travel in the public transport, I do not know what the situation is in Europe, but then uh, subconsciously individuals put their finger in their nose and then that's how life is all about. And <clears throat> I came across this very interesting caption. Don't put your finger on the nose, use an artificial finger. It was costing $3 on the internet. It was a nose picking finger. It had a stick and a finger on that, so you can pick your nose around with that. And not only that, you see, see, in animals, the birds pick the nose, a gorilla picking the nose, a child picking the nose, and the royalty also picking the nose. You know, these are very common things which occur, and they are there, and this person has an emergency. But when bleeding occurs, it needs to be tackled because it can bleed a lot, it can cause you know, life threatening if it is not sorted out urgently, it's a scary thing, the child can collapse and you can have a sudden drop in the blood pressure and it's a scary thing. It can happen more in cold weather, it can happen more in the dry weather and why it happens? Because in the cold dry weather, the cold air goes in and that goes and hits if there is a deviation in the nose, it causes an eddy current over there, a, 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 a swelling of the air currents inside, that causes drying of the nasal mucosa, it causes crusting and when the crust falls down, bleeding can occur, epistaxis can occur. If we see what happens, this is the blood supply of the nose. We have the internal carotid system, the external carotid system supplying the blood supply to the nose. And the anterior part of the nose has the most common bleeding. So when you talk about the anterior epistaxis, it comes from an area which is known as Little's area, and that area is the one which has a large conglomeration of blood vessels which leads to epistaxis. So this is the area which gets traumatized when we put our finger in the nose, and this is supplied by four arteries, the anterior portal artery, the sphenopalatine, the superior labial and the greater palatine artery and this causes the bleeding most commonly. What can be the causes? Local causes, general causes, trauma, infections, foreign bodies, tumors, parotrauma, deviated nasal septum, hypertension, bleeding diathesis, hepatic causes, drugs, septicemia and above all idiopathic, I don't know the cause. So anything can cause uh, uh, bleeding from the nose. What happens? The normal tendency of the individual is how to treat it is by blocking the nose, pressing the finger, very nice. But what the normal uh, layman would do is make the patient lie down. That's something which is not to be done. Ask the patient to tilt his head back. That is something which is not to be done. Because if you are going to tilt his head back, the nose, the blood is going to flow back into the nasal cavity, into the airway and you can aspirate, you will swallow it. So the treatment is, this is how the treatment is, you need to press your nose and bend forward and keep it like that for 5 minutes, majority of the bleedings, nose bleed will stop, 90% they will stop, but in case they do not stop, then they may need intervention. So bleeding control, we need to achieve hemostasis, we need to have precedence for controlling the bleeding rather than going, taking an examination, taking a detailed history, now that's for the secondary thing, first thing is choose, uh, choose how to close the bleeding. So arrest the bleeding, A for admission, R for reassurance, resuscitation, E for establishing the site of the bleeding, S for stop the bleeding, and P is for treating the cause. So you need to arrest the bleeding in a small manner. How do you arrest the bleeding? You can do nasal packing, you can put in a gauze piece inside, you can use balloons, you can use um, a nasal sponge. And how do the balloons look like? These are how the nasal balloons look like. You put the balloon inside the nose, you inflate it with air, it compresses on the nose, and the bleeding stops. So this is how the epistaxis should be controlled. If it doesn't work, you need to have surgical intervention, you can do an endoscopic nasal uh, arterial ligation, you can do a transcentral ligation of the maxillary artery, you can do external carotid ligation, and you can do selective embolization to manage the situation. Trauma. Another cause for trauma, for the emergency for epistaxis is accidents, a battered baby, and cost education. These three things are very common. Battered baby, we had a very interesting case 
the child was a six months old girl and we removed foreign bodies from the ear and the nose and the parents said the child is bleeding. We had no reason. And every time we cleaned the nose, a new foreign body came up. We didn't know from where it was coming. And then we put a video camera. We saw the father putting the foreign body in the child, nose and in the ear. It was a very tragic thing, but that was a case of a battered baby syndrome. Caustic ingestion. We normally have caustics lying in the house, acids, alkalis, and we keep it in some bottle which is a household bottle. And by mistake, considering it's probably a cola or a water, the child drinks it and leads to a caustic ingestion leading to stenosis. A very dangerous situation which needs to be avoided. Sinus infections can lead to abscess, can lead to cellulitis, are also emergencies which need to be tackled, and these emergencies are dangerous get life setting because that can cause an intracranial problem. Retrophrangeal abscess. Just behind our, in front of our spine and behind our pharynx, we have a space which is the retrophrangeal space. An infection from the tonsils, infection of anything can lead to retrophrangeal abscess. And that is something which again needs to be handled. It can be drained, antibiotics to be given, and a cause for infection to be formed out. Facial cellulitis. We have a boil anywhere on the face. It can lead to infections spread all over. Staphylococcal infection, it needs to be tackled with staphylococcal or hemophilus influenza infection and it needs to be tackled with antibiotics. Another emergency is epicloritis. Crew. The child certainly has a crowing sort of a sound and this is present more in winters. It is present with hemophilus influenza infection. The covering over the larynx is the epiglottis that gets inflamed. And once that gets inflamed, the child would have a muffled voice, the child would have respiratory difficulty. So we need to handle that urgently. And this is how the x-ray would look. It's a classically described as a thumb sign. This is the epiglottis which is inflamed and this is what the epiglottis looks like. The thumb sign it looks like a thumb which is, which is there. Laryngotracheobronchitis is a corollary of that. It can have an inflammation of the airway, the trachea, the bronchus and lead to a sudden respiratory problems. Two emergencies which I always quote at the end of my lecture. One is spook exposure. It's very nice to smoke if you want to smoke, it's your baby. But for every packet you smoke, I smoke for cigarettes. So if you are smoking with your baby in front, your baby is smoking because of you. That induces changes in the respiratory tracts. The, the cottony markers are associated with increased inflammation, increased ear infections, chest infections, the vertoria, CSOM, all these issues will come up apart from the other risks of smoking. This is something which needs to be dealt with. I've always put these two because this is an emergency which I feel like. And another emergency which I think is important is to make more noise to stop noise. DJs, bars, loud music, the uh, continuous use of telephones, the earphones, the ear devices what we're using. These are some things which are a day-to-day -day issues. So ENT problems which are there are there for all of us, but it is not an ENT surgeon's problem. It is the problem of a pediatrician, of a cardiothoracic surgeon, a chest physician, an ENT surgeon. It is a problem of each one of us. It is a problem of the team and friends. I always say, who forms the team? You form the team. It is up to you for looking into the whole thing. At the end of the thing, I thank you all for a very patient hearing. I will quote John F. Kennedy. Patients are the world's most valuable teachers and are the best hope for treating the future. Look after them as best as you can. Thank you so much.
India is a vast country with 1.3 billion population. It is the second most populous country in the world. And we have a very strong rural base. Almost 75% of our population is rural based and 25% is urban based. So if you look at that, the hygiene maintenance standards need to be told to the individuals. We have a very good system of disseminating the um, public health awareness system in the rural areas by the auxiliary nurse midwives, by the various health workers, by the teachers who are exposed to these things and they are telling in the schools and the classes how to go about it. So it is, the public awareness is increasing and I think once that increases, our issue gets sorted out in a very nice way. Just ask a question about um, the content of one of the slides. You spoke about um, the battered baby. Yeah, battered baby syndrome. Battered baby, you know, uh, it is a psychological aberration in a parent or in any, any individual. Uh, due to a psychological, it's a psychiatrical problem in which the baby bears a blood. There are certain countries in the world where maybe a girl child is not a wanted child. A male baby is a much more precious baby for those families. So, this comes as a psychological aberration where a parent may beat up a child also. It is the parent who is a parent or a close relative or an unknown individual who is there who may beat up into a psychological aberration. This is known as the battered baby syndrome. It is a syndrome which is there in which the baby comes with multiple fractures, it can come with facial injuries. It has been reported uh, quite often the baby comes to us with these situations. And so in this case, the father introduced... The father injured. This, this case has been reported just now. The father used to put a foreign body in the ear, in the nose, and by putting it, it used to traumatize, and the baby was having uh, repeated foreign body and bleeding from the ear and the nose. The baby had a facial paralysis because the father tended to press in the foreign bodies inside, and we video recorded, we just, without telling the father, we had put a video uh, recorded over the child's bed and at night we found them. In, in his house? In the hospital, we had to admit the, the hospital. We had to admit the, 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 the baby because we were, we were very worried. Why are we straight? Because a, a six month old child cannot get the foreign body that he was putting in. You know, if, if he puts in probably something lying on the bed, I would accept it. Okay, fine, he put it up and put it. But having a wheat grain or having a small stone inside, how can the baby get a stone? Somebody has put it inside, but who's put it inside? So we had to. Uh, record the thing to find out what the cause is. It's a very surprising revelation. I mean, as, as of this sort of a case, I saw it for the first time. So it, it does come out as a shock at times. There's so many uh, psychological aberrations which come across. And justification of the father? No justification. No, no, no. no justification. That's why it's a, it's a psychological or psychiatric aberration. I mean, there's no justification for that. It's a, it's a disease, it's a sickness. Okay. We published a recent study in the Venetian region about um, seasonal trends of um, uh, body body injuries. Mm -hmm. Would you like to know if even in India there is a seasonal trend? Yes, we do have seasonal trend. Because, like I said, Erika, there are certain other seeds which are prevalent in a particular season. So those seeds, the Dhatuas is a thing, which I don't know what you call it over here. It's a green seed with spicules all over it. And in school we used to throw it on the back, it used to stick onto the sweaters. And that is in a particular eight time of the season, that's swallowed at that, in, in that area. And, and those are what is coming across. So it would depend on what seeds are available, uh, it, it does have a seasonal variation. Then in winter months, in dry months, because the nose is more itchy, so one tends to scratch more and in this process a foreign body is inserted. Now you, you, you take a pencil, a child in probably would try to scratch his nose and the back part of the rubber gets detached and goes inside and it left inside. Or a bit of a crayon or a chalk while there, it's there, okay fine, it's there, so we, we can't remove it, that's simple as that. How many require hospitalization rather than just a CSI is a standard, standard ear foreign body which is lying in the external retinal or in the nose, they don't require hospitalization. They are a routine part, in fact, every day about two to three come to us in the emergency, just remove it and send the child back. But any foreign body which is in the esophagus, in the bronchus, has to be removed, it is removed in the anesthesia, the child is admitted, next day the child is operated upon fasting, and his discharge if all goes well, uh, which is normally the thing, but at times complications do occur in the foreign body is old, like one of the slides that showed you, the battery had perforated the esophagus of the in the thoracic, the thoracotomy. At times, a sharp foreign body is there with perforates, 
There are certain foreign bodies that are difficult to identify. One of the most difficult foreign bodies to identify is a fish bone. Now, if you've seen a fish bone, it's almost transparent, it's translucent. So, once you, you, you dig out seed, and it's only in the reflected light that you're able to see a fish bone. So, it's very difficult to sight a fish bone. And if it's lying in a uh, to the esophagus, it can perforate through the to the superior mucosa and go out and the only way you can detect it is maybe if you miss it out and access the other surrounding and that can lead to a problem. So foreign bodies are a challenge at any given point of time, however experienced a person is, it still is a nice thing. Thank you. Thank you so much.